I'm so glad that you guys are here. First and foremost, my name is Nathan. I serve as our kids pastor here, and so I do have the absolute greatest job in pastoring kids up to the age of 11. After that, I'm not sure what happens. Um, something changes in their minds and everything, but I'm so glad that I get to be a part of this team with you guys. Uh, but before we really get started, can I just can we just thank Pastor Eugene and Miss Laura for doing such amazing things? Can we just... Give them a big round of applause. They're amazing. I know they're out serving and, and doing some amazing things, but we love them. We love you, Pastor Eugene and Miss Laura. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And if you are joining us online, we love you as well. Thank you so much for being here and joining this service with us. Before we jump into the service, we got City Fest. You heard that crazy voice on there that I had to do. It, I think it took me like 10 tries to say all of that. But City Fest is coming up this next Friday. It is already here. And we would love for you to join our team. We have a booth out there where you could sign up and you could hand out candy. You could do a trunk. You could decorate it in a fun way. Uh, you can help with one of the inflatables and all that stuff. But we're going to see, our goal is to see about 3,000 people here on campus, which is amazing. And so so we need all your help to just be able to make this happen for our community. What a great night it is for us to gather together and serve our community in a fun way. And I'll give you some candy if you do it. That's the catch. There you go. Hey, would you stand with me as we read and open up in the Word today? Today we're going to talk about, we're going to continue the story, we're going to continue talking about Matthew and everything that we've learned, and we're going to talk today about a humble King. And I love what it says in Philippians 2, and we're going to start with this. Philippians chapter 2, 6 through 8 says, Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Today we're going to talk about a king who became humble, who was humble when he came to join us here on this earth. Father, I thank you so much for this day. I pray, Lord, that you would open up our hearts to receive something special from you today. God, we ask, Lord, that you would speak to us. God, even if we've heard this text a hundred times, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would show us something new. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Amen. All right, so we're going to talk about Matthew chapter 21 as we continue the series in Matthew. But before we do that, I want to go back to Matthew 20 and give a quick overview because there's some things that are taking place in Matthew 20 that will help us understand Matthew 21 a little bit more. Jesus is traveling south to Jerusalem and a lot of things take place on his way as he's traveling uh, during that time in Matthew 20, uh, we see and hear the parable of the vineyard workers. The workers were hired through the day and paid the same wage. So the owner of the vineyard, he hired one, a couple people in, at the very beginning of the day, and then he hired some more people in the middle of the day, and then hired some more people at the end of the day. And they all got the same wage because that was what the owner had promised. Now, of course, in that parable, Jesus talks about how the people, those, uh, the workers were a little upset that they got the same wage as somebody who had just started. And I, I honestly would probably relate with that. If I started at the very beginning of the day and I was sweating and I was working so hard only to get to the end of the day and see that somebody that came on an hour ago is getting the same as me, I would probably be upset. But the vineyard, the owner told him, like, hey, don't complain because this is what we agreed upon. Jesus concludes the parable with the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Many are called, but few are chosen. Then Jesus uh, tells his death, he talks about his death and his resurrection. And then we hear the request of the mother from, of James and John and how he wants them to sit one at the left, one at the right hand of Jesus. And then Jesus had compassion, and heals the blind men. The big picture for all of chapter uh, 20 is the chapter tells about Jesus, how Jesus was walking to his death. He was walking to his death. The time, place, circumstances of Jesus' death were known to him with precision. He knew about what was going to happen. If he had wanted to, he could avoid dying. No one could have killed him. He went on the cross willingly so that way we could be forgiven. Speaking of his death, Jesus said, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. 
This command I received from my Father. That's, a, that's in John chapter 10, verse 18. So we see Jesus is getting, he's walking south to Jerusalem and all of these different things are happening. Uh, Jesus was probably in much better shape than me because he probably got his 10,000 steps every single day and some. So good for you, Jesus. Thank you. And his disciples probably. But as we look into Jesus, uh, into Jesus, into Matthew chapter 21, I want to kind of set the place where Jesus is and set the scene for you. And we can do that by reading Matthew chapter 21, one through three. It says, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. If you need to get out of an appointment, if you need to get out of going to somebody's house that you don't want to, just say the Lord. Lord needs me and they will understand. All right. If Jesus did it, I'm trying to be like Jesus. If you just don't want to go to dinner with uh, your in-laws or maybe you love your in-laws or any, anything, just get out of it. The Lord needs me and then just be on your way. No explanation is needed. You're good to go. But here's what we have. We have Jesus. Jesus is on the outside of Jerusalem and he is about to enter into Jerusalem in a very powerful way, but not the way that people often expected, especially back in those days. They wanted, they were expecting something completely different. In those days, they had heard of this king coming. They had heard of this king coming. That's why they tried to kill Jesus when he was a baby. That's why they hated, that's why the religious leaders hated him so very much. But their thought of Jesus entering was much different than God's thoughts. And how often do we have our thoughts, but God's thoughts are different than ours? God's path is different than our path. Matthew 21, 6 through 11. We got, we're going to go through some Bible scriptures today. I love it. Matthew 21, 6 through 11 says this. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the ground while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of, them, ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Most had this idea of a king coming to enter and conquer. A king who would take over and rule Israel with all force. This is the idea that they had when they had heard the prophecies about a king coming, about somebody that was going to come. They thought he was coming to rule in a different way. But here's what Jesus, here's, here's why Jesus entered this way. We go, we skip verse 5, so let's go back to verse 5 in Matthew 21, verse 5. It says, say to the daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and a colt the foal of a donkey. So the... Every, most everybody had this idea that there was going to be this conquering king who's going to come in with the swords and the shields and the armies and all of this good stuff. There's going to be this huge fight breakout and Jesus was going to conquer them and, and, and do whatever he's going to do that soldiers do and all oh, is going to be great and this grand is going to be great stories to tell the grandkids and all of this stuff. But Jesus came as a humble king on a donkey. Jesus enters in humility. Jesus enters in humility. Jesus wasn't coming as a conquering king, but rather one who was humble and full of mercy and grace. One that would bring everlasting life and defeat death. Philippians 2 helps us understand why he did this. So we read it earlier. We're going to go back to it. Philippians 2, 6 through 8. Who being in very nature God, okay, remember that phrase for a second, very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death and even death on a cross. By being the very nature of God, he humbled himself. 
The very nature of God is humble. God is humble. Jesus came in as the very nature of God, so that means he came in as a humble servant. That's a big deal. Now, as we look at this, we can kind of put our shoes in the crowd a little bit. Here he is. He's coming in on this donkey. People are laying things down. People are screaming. They're going crazy. And as he enters, the crowd has their own response. The crowd welcomes Jesus with shouts of Hosanna and the son of David, which show that they recognize him as Messiah, at least partially, even maybe a little bit. Hosanna, which means save us now, and son of David was the name for the coming Messiah. They may have praised Jesus as the anticipated Messiah, but many misunderstood the nature of his mission. So there, here's this big, giant crowd. They're all gathering. They're shouting Hosanna. They're celebrating. They're excited, but they're not understanding why in the world they are doing this and celebrating and, and being all excited. It's almost like when you go to a theme park and, and the crowd begins to gather and they're starting to, they're starting to shout, yeah, and you're like, oh, you, energy gets going. You're like, yeah, we're shouting too. We're so excited. And then all of a sudden this character walks by and you're like, oh, why am I shouting for that character? I don't even like that character. But you are so into it. You were, so, you were having fun with the crowd and it was a blast only to realize, why in the world did I just do that? Because I don't even like that character. That's what a lot of these guys were doing. They were screaming, they were shouting, they were excited. They were saying, Hosanna! Hosanna! And not even understanding the depth of the word that they were saying during this time. How often do we do the same, though? We see God change someone's life, or we see someone excited about Jesus, and we jump on the wagon! We're excited with them, but we don't feel, fully understand the nature of what we are celebrating. Maybe you sit and, and you see people worshiping and, and they're jumping up and down in church and you can see the freedom and you're excited for them, but you don't understand the thing that they are celebrating necessary. You see, the expectations of the people during this time were more political than they were spiritual. They had hoped that, they would, that he would be the one to bring them freedom from the Roman overlords. And their shouts of Hosanna, which means uh, save us now, probably reflected that. So here they are, this crowd, they're excited, they're shouting, they're pumped up. They see what everybody is calling the Savior. They're, they hear the Messiah is coming, but they don't have a full grasp of what that actually means. They just think that Jesus is going to come and overturn the Roman government, and he's probably got ninja swords on, the, on his back that nobody can see, and the donkey's probably holding some ninjas and all of this stuff, and ninja stars are going to go flying in a second. I don't know why ninjas, but it's just fun. I guess I'm a kid's pastor, and that's what kids talk about are ninjas. My son doesn't stop talking about ninjas. They had this idea of Jesus. How many of us have an idea about Jesus? Maybe it's an idea that doesn't align with what the word says. Maybe it's an idea that we've heard from somebody else. But we all have this idea of Jesus. Matthew 21, verse 10. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is a little bit of a crazy text right here, okay? Because let's break this down for a second, all right? So here is Jesus entering into Jerusalem, and the whole city is stirred. It's a big city. So number one, the presence of Jesus cannot be unseen here, right? The presence of Jesus in somebody's life cannot be unseen. When it's there, it's there. And people are seeing this, and the crowd is getting stirred up, and things are going crazy. And they're asking, who is this? Who is this? We're excited that he's here. We don't know what he's doing, but woohoo, he's here. And then other people answer, this is Jesus, the prophet. Wow, they're missing it. They're missing it. Jesus had been trying to teach these people. Jesus had been trying to tell them who he was. And all they gather is that Jesus is a prophet. They're missing out of it. They seem to be conflicted with who Jesus was, what to expect the Messiah to be like, was he a prophet? Was he the Messiah? Was he both? Who is this guy? What is going on? Why is he riding in on this donkey? 
the question that lingers over all of Jesus' life, who is this man? You know, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I have a question lingering over my life, it can almost put my life to a halt if I don't have the answer. If I live my life with thinking, who is this man? And that's what people kept asking, who is this man? And they didn't have a full understanding of who I was. It would cause me to not be able to do the things that God has for me because I'd be so worried about what other people think. Jesus lived with this question his whole life. I guarantee that when he was 12 years old in the temple and he was spending time with the, with the leaders and he was learning and he was teaching them and he was growing in stature and favor with man and God, I guarantee people were looking at him and saying, who is this kid? Why is he here right now? Where's his family? And as he gets older and he's healing people and miracles are happening, who is this man? People kept asking. They thought he was just a prophet. They thought he was just somebody that wasn't that significant. They misunderstood the celebration of his mighty entry. The crowd wanted this victorious hero. They, they, they expected their Messiah. I bet they were probably thinking he's going to come in and he's going to be jacked and with muscles and bald with a beard and look just as good as Pastor Nathan. And man, this is exactly who they expected. They wanted this hero. Because if you go back and look, they picked King Saul because he had the right look. They picked him because he looked right. They had this idea of a Messiah that didn't match who the Messiah really is. They were oppressed. They were under the Roman rule, the poor and the working class. They wanted hope. They were clinging to hope. We cling to hope. We're looking for the thing that's going to get us ahead. We're looking for the thing that's going to help us. We're looking for the people that will be there for us. We're clinging to hope. And they were asking that question, who is this man? Who is this man to me? What are my expectations of him? We all ask that question, I feel like, at some point in our life. Do I expect Jesus to act a certain a way with me? Is he like Santa Claus or a vending machine where I put my prayers in and get answers back? Now, one thing about Santa Claus is that when I would write to Santa Claus, I never got anything back. They would just, the presence would be there, and then all of a sudden I didn't get anything back. I didn't get like a, hey, I'm thinking about you, Nathan, or anything like that, and all of that stuff. So there's that, but do we see Jesus like that? Do we see Jesus as somebody that we could just write prayers to and then not really get anything back or hope that maybe we'll get the right answer back? Do we expect him to airlift us up out of our uh, crisis? Or what if he parachutes? You know, he comes down and parachutes. He's real cool. You know, he's got like his army fatigues on and he's like just doing, he's like so cool. Is that good enough for you? Is that how we expect Jesus? Am I content with being sent into the world as, a, as Jesus was sent? These are questions that if I asked over in kids' church, we'd have a kid say, yeah, me, yeah, that's me right there. I don't expect you to answer it out loud, but I want you to think about these questions. Are you content with being sent into the world as Jesus was sent? He sends us that way in John 12. He was sent to serve, to suffer, and to suffer. Do we expect God to keep us from that kind of service? Wow. What do we expect? What will it take not to be a fair weather follower anymore? What do we expect? Do we expect God for, to want us to be a humble servant the way Jesus was? These are questions that we have to wrestle with. As we have to answer these questions every day, every minute, every hour, our response defines us. It defines our relationship with God. Will we be true disciples of Jesus no matter what? Is it is good to evaluate who Jesus is in our lives often. Because it's easy for us to come to church and hear a pastor tell us what Jesus is and who he was and what he did and who he should be in our life. But, and we can apply that to our lives, and that's a great step. But if we don't figure out who Jesus is in our own lives as a Christ follower, we're going to fall short. We're not going to figure out who Jesus truly is in our lives. So here's the crowd. They're asking who is this man? What is going on? I'm celebrating him, but I don't understand why. So you got those people, and then you got the religious leaders, who, who, who are just nasty people. They would sit back there with their arms crossed. They'd mean mug everybody. If you didn't do it right, if you didn't tithe enough, if you didn't give enough money, if you didn't give what they wanted you to give, 
if you did all of these crazy things, they were under the Roman rule and all of this stuff. They were following what they thought was right. And they didn't know who this man was either. But I wonder who they thought Jesus was. The second thing that we can understand is that Jesus, or the king's authority over worship. The people may have expected that the victorious Messiah, this fellow on a donkey, would make a left turn when he got into the gates of Jerusalem and march up to the center of the Roman government in Jerusalem and overcome it. They thought that Jesus was going to just get on this donkey. They're probably thinking, first of all, why in the world is a man on a donkey? Why is he not on a horse or a chariot? What's going on? Okay, we'll take that. He's on a donkey. He's going up to Jerusalem. He's going to go straight up to the Roman Empire and he's going to knock some heads and he's going to become king and he's going to rule and this is going to be amazing. And he's our Messiah. He's our Savior. Yes. But what I love about my Jesus is that he has something different in mind. He wasn't, wor- he wasn't worried about ruling on the worldly side. He was worried about ruling in our hearts. Matthew 21, 12 says Jesus has something different in mind. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of, money cha- of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Wow. He walked straight up to the temple. He walked straight up to the church and he said, not happening. He took the tables and he turned them. He said, this is not happening in this place. If Jesus walked straight through those doors right now, what would he think about the people in this church right now? Here's what I'm thankful for. I am thankful that we have a pastor, Pastor Eugene and Laura, who says this is a place of worship. This is a house where the needy and the poor and those who are broken can come in and be a part. I am thankful that I serve under a pastor whose heart is what God has and who listens to the things of God. That is our pastor. This is a place of worship. Those who are broken are welcome here. Those who think differently, they're welcome here. Those who are hurting, they're welcome here. Those who are needy are welcome here. Those who are poor are welcome here. But not in the temple that Jesus was dealing with. They were out there exchanging money. They they had so many different things. In order to fulfill the law, which required people to bring sacrifices, because you've got to remember this is before Jesus died on the cross. In order to bring sacrifices to the temple, a business atmosphere had been set up in the temple area, exchanging money from other countries for the shekels to pay the temple tax, with the selling animals to sacrifice, with selling the animals to sacrifice. There is evidence in old Jewish manuscripts that some of these merchants charged huge amounts of money for the doves, which was the animal the poor brought, bought to sacrifice because they couldn't afford any other. It was a commercialized thing that these religious leaders had had made. They had brought this whole thing in. They were worried about money. They were worried about their pride. They were worried about making sure whatever they had enough, that they were charging huge amounts of money so that way the poor couldn't do what they needed to do. They didn't care about the poor. They didn't care about the needy. They They cared about their pockets. They cared about the things that were going on. The temple was meant to be a house of prayer for all nations, but it had become a place of corruption and exploitation. This was not just about commerce. It was about the corrupt practices in a place meant for God's presence. Jesus had righteous indignation at the profaning of what was holy. Jesus was upset. But you got to remember, Jesus was still humble. Jesus was humble, but he was fierce. Jesus was humble, but he was strong. Jesus was humble, but he wasn't going to let anything happen and slide by him. Jesus is my king. Jesus is incredible. Now let's listen to what the prophet Malachi described about the coming Messiah, what he would do. Malachi chapter 3, 1 through 4 says, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord... Uh, Suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launder's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. 
Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. And the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be accept, acceptable to the Lord, as in the days gone by, as in former years. Jesus came to be the refiner. Jesus came to set things right. Jesus came humbly on a donkey, but fiercely ready to fight for the church, ready to fight for his people. Jesus is the refiner. This is a good time to look at ourselves and evaluate our own worship because these religious leaders, as they're sitting back, as their arms are crossed, as they're mean mugging people, their worship, their idea of worship was so much different than the idea that God has for us. And then as I look at that and as I look at their lives and then I want to reflect on my life for a second, I want you to reflect on your lives for a second Does the Lord need to purify our worship? Are we bringing him our very best? Are we bringing him our first offering? Are our offerings righteous? Are we single-minded as we worship God? Do we only worship at church or do we worship at home and throughout the day? Are our hearts distracted when we worship? Do we confess our sins and worship with a clean heart? These are good questions to ask ourselves to evaluate our lives. These are good questions. Do we do this or do we sit to the side like a religious leader on a Sunday morning? And do we judge what other people are doing? Oh, that person had their hands lifted up last week. They're going through it now because their hands aren't up this week. Oh, that worship, that just that didn't hit right this time. I don't know about that song. I heard it on the radio and it sounded way better than this time. Oh, that bald guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Okay. Mm -hmm. But do we do this? We sometimes we sit here and we act like a religious leader and we judge the things that are happening around us without even realizing half the time that we're doing it. And we need to evaluate and look at our own lives to see, man, I messed up. The thing that you can do that's different from the religious leaders is you can accept and realize when you've messed up. They couldn't accept it. They couldn't look at themselves and say, man, I really messed up on that one. They didn't do that. The king's compassion and authority. So as we move on to this thing and as we talk more about these religious leaders, here's their response to this whole thing. This gets a little wild. They've seen Jesus do miracles. They've seen Jesus speak. They've seen his teachings. They've seen how he interacts with people. They know, they have seen that this man is not coming around with swords and trying to fight everybody. They see that this man is humble. And here's their response in Matthew 21, verse 14 through 17. It says, the blind and lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priest and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Okay, let me go back for a second. When the teachers of the law, these are the teachers. These are the people that know everything about everything. They've read the old scriptures. They know what Jesus is talking about. They know it. They are the teachers of the law. If you wanted to know something back in the day, you went to them to know about God more. Because they're supposed to have it all. He, they saw the wonderful things that he did in the children shouting in the temples, Hosanna to the son of David. And they were upset. Did you hear what these children are saying, they asked? Wow, that's a bold statement to ask Jesus. But you see, the thing is, is that we know Jesus. They didn't know Jesus. We get to see how the story, you know, goes for Jesus. We see that he died and resurrected for us. They didn't get to see that. They didn't realize that we're reading about them right now. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants? You, Lord, have called forth your praise. And he left them and went out to the city in Bethany where he spent them. They came at him. They were probably yelling at him. They were upset. They were fuming. They were angry. Jesus gave his answer and then he left them. Probably to stand there and ponder what in the world did Jesus just say. I imagine it was like a mic drop scene. Just bam, dropped the mic and he walked out and that was it. And, he's, and they're just like left like what in the world just happened? And they're asking this question, who is this man? 
Here we see the stark contrast between the way Jesus relates to people versus the religious authorities. He was compassionate toward the, uh, the needy and the authorities. They didn't care. But then I, I, as I read that scripture and I read it over and over and over, something huge stuck out to me. And it says in 16, do you hear what these children are saying? The children figured out what most adults are struggling to understand. The children figured it out. The adults were struggling to understand. The kids didn't, they weren't looking for the Savior to come in and overtake the Roman Empire. They just saw that this man was the Messiah. They just saw that this man was going to somehow save them, and they were excited about it. Let me tell you something. Kids understand what Jesus is doing better than most adults do sometimes. Better than me sometimes. Last week, I just got to throw this in there real quick. Last week, we had an amazing service. And it was sometimes we have these services in kids' ministry where I have to just look at the kids and say, hey, we're going to talk about something tough today. Because here's the thing. I don't want your kids and my kids to walk away with a watered-down gospel. I want them to know that Jesus is their Savior. I want them to know that they can look to Jesus. So we had this conversation, and we can all relate to it. We're talking about Job. We're in a series on Job. And I said, hey, kids, just want you to know. Let's be serious for a second. That's one kid's giggling in the back, always. I said, hey, let's be serious for a moment. You're going to lose something in this life. It's going to happen. And kids looked at, you know, you got their attention. Oh, my goodness. And I said, hey, you're going to either lose a stuffy one day. You might lose your favorite video game one day. You might lose your favorite pet one day. You might lose a family member one day. I said, but kids, we're gonna, we have to talk about this. Because Job lost every single thing in his life. But he didn't give up. And I said, when we lose something, boys and girls, we don't give up. We look to God. And there, we had some kids crying. And they, were, they had a moment with God realizing that God is their Savior. God is going to help them in their times of need. And I wonder sometimes if we can come to a Sunday and we're just here because it's what we do on Sundays and we don't really receive what the person on the stage is saying and we're just here because this is what we do on a Sunday. I want to challenge you that every time you walk into a Sunday service or a Wednesday service or a small group, that you would have your heart ready to receive something that God has for you, even if you've heard the text 100 times. Kids come in ready every single week to hear something new. But how in the world is it that kids understand who Jesus is better than sometimes adults do? Well, the thing about kids is that they have humble hearts. Sometimes they don't, and you have to humble those hearts a little bit more. But most of the time, kids have a nice, humble heart. They're pure. And I've come to realize that humble hearts, a humble heart understands a humble person. Those kids at the time of Jesus, they saw that man, and they said, that's the Messiah. I don't fully understand what's going on, but that's the Messiah. I'm going to shout at the top of my lungs that that is Hosanna. That is the person that's going to save us. These kids had a better understanding of who Jesus was. The blind and the lame were often excluded from the temple worship because they were blemished. But by healing them, Jesus is not only restoring their health, but their place in worship. God invited them into his presence. You know what this did to the religious leaders? They looked at Jesus and they were mad. They looked at Jesus and said, how in the world could you heal those people? So how in the world can they go into the temple? How can they get in there and be restored? How could you do that? Why would you do that? What were you thinking? How can you say that you are the Messiah? How can you say that you are God? They were missing what Jesus was trying to teach them. What's the main difference between the people and the religious authorities? That sounds like a joke. That's not, that's not like the opening to a joke. The people are for Jesus and the authorities are against him. They are jealous when they think they are zealous for God, but really they are opposing God. Here they are thinking that they're zealous for God, thinking that they're following every law to the very T. They're dotting their I's, they're crossing their T's and all of that saying, and they're doing exactly what the law says supposedly, and they're upset with Jesus because he just kind of comes in and changes things up. And they think that they're zealous for God when in fact they're jealous of the things that are happening around. They're not the one performing the miracles. People aren't listening to them anymore. How many of us get our jealousy and our zealous confused oftentimes? 
Well, I come to church every single Sunday. I sit in the, this is not anybody in the fourth row, but I sit in the fourth row every week. If you sit in the fourth row every week, thank you for doing that. I sit in that same row every single, every single week. This is my seat. How come I'm not receiving something from God? How come the person all the way in the back is receiving something from God? I'm doing everything. I open up and I read my Bible. You see, we can do all of the right things. We can know every teaching there is. You, you can read the Bible front to back and still not have a relationship with God. I've met many people who know the Bible way more than I do. And yet their relationship with God is not existent because they're worried about religion rather than relationship. God did not come so that way we would have a better religion. He came that we would have a relationship with him. Jesus sent his son to die for us. That's what Matthew's in the, is one of the gospels. The gospel means good news. This is good news today. But they just couldn't wrap their minds around that. The authorities just couldn't figure it out. They were jealous. As the week progressed, the, the religious leaders continued to set traps for Jesus in their effort to defeat him and his influence on the people to regain their influence over the people. They did everything they could. They were setting traps. You got to remember, Jesus was already on his walk to his death. Jesus already knew what was taking place. Jesus was continuing that walk. Every step Jesus took, he knew how much closer it was getting him to death. They asked, they questioned his authority. They asked about paying taxes, trying to trap him as a revolutionary person against the Roman government. They tried to trap him by asking absurd questions about the resurrection. They tried to trap him by asking about the greatest commandment of the law. Here's what I love about Jesus is that Jesus, he's humble, but he's fierce. He's humble, but he's strong. He finally responds by asking them about the identity of the Messiah. Say, yo, who's the Messiah? And they said, we can't answer that. We don't recognize him. We don't know. He's, he's like basically jumping up and down. I'm standing right here. I'm standing in front of you. You can turn from your ways. I am right here. And they kept saying, I don't recognize him. Wow. They wouldn't recognize him. They, kept t they continued to judge who Jesus was. They have Jesus in their crosshairs at this point. And there he's going to remain until his crucifixion. They were mad. They were angry. They were upset. How many of us can relate to that a little bit, though? You know, we go to church. We do, we do the right thing. But sometimes we don't get the answer from God that we're expecting. And it kind of puts a wall between us and God. And, and we become judgmental about who God is in our lives and what other people are receiving. But then I also ask, I want to ask the question of where would you be on that day? When all of this is taking place in Matthew 21, where would you be? Which, where, where would you be standing? Would you be on the side of the religious leaders who had their arms crossed, not believing anything this Messiah was saying? Not anything that Jesus was saying? Or would you be on the other side who are singing and praising to this Messiah, but not maybe fully having an understanding of who Jesus was? Or would you be in the middle, torn to go bo both ways? You're worried about what these people are saying, but you're also worried about what these people are saying. Are you worried about what your family's saying today about God? And maybe you don't give God everything that you have because you're worried that if you jump fully into it, your family might disown you? Are you worried about what your coworkers might say if you say, hey, I, you know, I just love Jesus, and you just say something simple? Are you worried about what they might say or what they might do? Are you worried about the other people around that you can't take a stand and say, I stand with Jesus? Where are you at in your life today? Are you able, can you look at yourself today and say, I would stand with Jesus in that time? It's easy for us to answer that question right now because we've seen what happens. We've seen that Jesus died on a cross for us. We've seen that our sins have been forgiven. We see that we have a relationship with him. But if through all of that, through seeing every ounce of that, can we look at ourselves in the mirror and say, if worse comes to worse, I stand with Jesus today. If my life depends on it, I stand with Jesus today. Can we look at ourselves and say that? Following Jesus means more than just joining the crowd in celebrations. It means taking up your cross and following him. It means not faltering when Jesus doesn't meet your expectations. It means following Jesus when a pastor or a church leader lets you down. 
It means remembering that we as, uh, we as Jesus are in the world to serve. We look forward to the rewards of the next life, but now, right in this life, we sacrifice and serve as he did. That's what, me, that's what it means to follow Jesus. Can you do it? Can you do it as a lifelong Christian? Can you do it as a new believer? Can you do it as maybe somebody who hasn't given their life to Jesus yet? People might not like you. People might say mean things to you. People might look at you funny. People might disown you. But God is welcoming you into his family. God is welcoming you into his kingdom. Matthew 21 shows us a humble king, not one who came to conquer the people. But just because Jesus was humble doesn't mean he wasn't going back he wasn't going to back down to those who came against him. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that you're going to back down. Being a Christian means that you're going to be strong. You're going to be humble. You're going to lead people to Jesus. But you're going to be strong in your faith. You're not going to let people talk bad about your Jesus. You're not going to let people talk bad about God. You're going to live your life the way Jesus would. We are called to remain faithful to him when his way is difficult or when the world turns against us, just as Jesus did. Jesus kept moving forward towards his death because he was thinking about us. He could have turned around. He could have quit. He could have said, no way, not doing this. But he realized that his purpose on this earth was greater than what people thought about him. Your purpose on this earth is greater than what those around you think about you. If we stay humble... If we stay humble and we surrender to God, we will be on the right track. Would you stand with me for a moment and just close your eyes for a second? Just want us to think about a couple things before we go into worship. How is it that the ones who studied and knew scripture were the ones that were missing out on who Jesus was? They knew everything about the scriptures. They studied it. They were the ones that people would go to, and they missed out. We can study all the scriptures and miss out on a relationship with Jesus. I got a couple questions. As I, was, as I was going through this message and trying to figure out where we wanted to go and what the application would be, I came up with a few questions that I asked myself that I think are really important. How do you see Jesus? Is Jesus your king? Do you know the scripture and yet don't know Jesus? These are some tough questions. I've asked a lot of tough questions, but these are questions that will help us in our relationship with God. They will help us help others. At this time, I'm going to invite our prayer partners to come and join us during our worship. And if you're in this room and you're struggling with your relationship with Jesus, you're struggling with standing with him no matter what, no matter what people say, no matter what people do, and you need somebody to come alongside of you and pray with you. I want to open up these altars, and I want you to find one of our prayer partners and begin to allow them to pray over you. And may, maybe you haven't given your heart to God, and you just need to talk with somebody about it. Our prayer partners are a great moment for that. But Father, as we stand here ready to worship, Father, God, we thank you. Lord, that you are a humble king. And I ask, Lord, that you would reveal yourself to us right here in this place right now, Father. <laughs> Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you didn't come in as a conquering king. Lord, you taught us to be humble and to serve others. So, Father, we just ask, Lord, during this moment of worship that you would speak to us in a powerful way. In Jesus' name.